Hey everyone, welcome back to theCUBE. We are covering VMware Explore live in San Francisco. This is our third day of wall-to-wall -wall coverage and John Furrier is here with me, Lisa Martin. We are excited to welcome two guests from Cast and by Veeam. Please welcome Tom Layden, VP of Marketing, and Matt LeBlanc, not Joey from Friends, Matt LeBlanc, the systems engineer from North America at Cast and by Veeam. Welcome guys, great to have you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Great. Tom. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, talk, talk to us about some of the, the, the key challenges customers are coming to you with. Um, key challenges that they have at this point is getting up to speed with Kubernetes. So everybody has it on their list, like we want to do Kubernetes, but where, where are they going to start? Um, back when VMware uh, came on the market, um, I was switching from Windows to Mac and I needed to run a Windows application on my Mac and someone told me, run a VM. I went to the, to the internet, I downloaded it, and in a half hour I was done. That's not how it works with Kubernetes. So that's a bit of a challenge. I mean, Kubernetes, at least remember the early days of the cube, <coughs> OpenStack was kind of transitioning, cloud was booming, and then Kubernetes was the paper that became the thing that pulled everybody together. It's now de facto in my mind, so that's clear. But there's a lot of different versions of it, and you hear VMware, they call it the dial tone. Years ago, remember Pat Kelsey, it's a dial tone. Turns out that came from Kit Colbert, or no, I think AJ kind of coined the term here. But it's since been there, it's been adopted by everyone. There's different versions, there's open source, AWS is involved. How do you guys look at the relationship with Kubernetes here at VMware Explorer with Kubernetes and the customers? Because they have choices. Mm -hmm. They can go do it on their own, they can add a little bit with Lambda, or serverless, they can do more here. It's, it's not easy, it's not, it's, not, it's not like as easy as people think it is. And then and this is a skill gaps problem too. We're seeing a lot of these problems out there. What's your take? And, and that's, I'll let, Matt talked to that, but what I want to say first is this is also the power of the cloud native ecosystem. The days are gone where companies were selecting one enterprise application and they were building their stack with that. Today they're building application, uh, ap applications using dozens, if, if not hundreds, of, of different components from, from different vendors or open source uh, platforms. And that is really what creates opportunities for those cloud native developers. So maybe you want to... Uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, hybrid solutions out there. So it's not just choosing one vendor, AKS, EKS, or Tanzu, we're seeing all of the above. <coughs> I had a call this morning with a large healthcare provider and they have 100 clusters and that's spread across AKS, EKS, and uh, GKE. So it, it is covering everything, plus the need to have the, a on-prem solution managing it all. I got a stat, I got to share, they want to get your reaction to it. You can laugh or comment, whatever you want to say. Talk to a uh, big CISO, CXO, executive, big company, I won't say the name. We got a thousand developers, okay? A hundred of them have heard of Kubernetes, okay? Uh, okay, um, 10 have touched it and used it, and one's good at it. And so his point is that there's a, there's a lot of Kubernetes need that people are getting aware of, so it shows that there's more and more adoption around this, a lot of managed services out there, so it's clear it's happening, and, and I'm, he's over-exaggerating the ratio probably, but the point is, the numbers kind of make sense. As a thousand, of the thousand developers, you start to see people getting adoption to it, they're aware of the value, but being good at it is what we're hearing is one of those things. Can you guys share your reaction to that? Is that I mean, it's hyperbole at, at some level, but it does point to the fact of adoption trends. You've got to get good at it, you got to know how to use it. It's, it's, it's very accurate, actually. It's what we're seeing in the market. We've been doing some research of our own, uh, and we have some interesting numbers that we're going to be sharing soon. Um, analysts don't have a whole lot of numbers these days, so we're, we're trying to run our own surveys to get a, a grasp of the market. Um, one simple survey or research element that I've done myself is I used um, Google Trends. And in Google Trends, if you go back to 2004 and you compare VMware against Kubernetes, you get a very interesting graph. What you're going to see is that VMware, the adoption curve is practically complete and Kubernetes is clearly taking off and the volume of searches for Kubernetes today is almost as big as VMware. So that's a big sign that this is starting to happen. Um, but in this process, we have to get those companies to have all of their engineers to be um, up to speed on, on Kubernetes. And that's one of the community efforts that we're helping with. We built a website called um, learning.casting.io. Uh, we're going to rebrand it soon at KubeCon, so stay tuned. Uh, but we're offering hands-on labs there for people to actually come learn Kubernetes with us because for us, the faster the adoption goes, the better for our business. I was just going to ask you about the learning. So there's a big focus here on educating customers to, to help dial down the complexity and really kind of 
get them get those numbers up as John was mentioning. Yeah, and we're really breaking it down to the very beginning, right? So uh, at this point, we have almost 10 labs, as we call them, uh, up. And they start really from install a Kubernetes cluster, and people really hands-on are going to install a Kubernetes cluster. They, they learn to build an application. They learn, obviously, to back up the application in the safest way. Um, and then there is uh, how to tune storage, how to implement security, and we're really building it up so that people can step-by-step, step, in a hands-on way, uh, learn Kubernetes. You know, it's interesting this VMware Explorer, the first new name change, but VMworld prior, big community, a lot of customer, loyal customers. Yeah, but they're classic, and they're foundational in enterprises. And you know, let's face it, some of them aren't going to rip out VMware anytime soon because they, the workloads are running on it. So, you know, Broadcom will have some good action to kind of maybe increase prices or whatnot. So we'll see how that goes. The, uh, but the personas here are definitely going cloud native. What they did with Tanzu was a great thing. Uh, some stuff was coming off, the, the fruit's coming off the tree now. You're starting to see it. CNCF has been on this for a long, long time. KubeCon's coming up in Detroit. Um, and so that's just always been great because you had you know, the day one, day zero event and you got all kinds of community activity. Tons of developer action. So here they're talking, let's connect to the developer. There the developers are at KubeCon. So mm -hmm. the, the personas are kind of connecting or overlapping. I'd love to get your thoughts, Matt. Really, so uh, from the the, the personnel that we're talking <laughs> to. There really is a split between the, the traditional IT ops and, and, and a lot of the people that have, would have, are here today at, at VMware Explore. Uh, but we're also talking with the, the SREs and the DevOps folks. Uh, what really needs to happen is we need to get a little bit more experience, some more training, and we need to get these, these two groups to really start to coordinate and work together. Because you're, you're basically moving from that traditional on-prem environment to a lot of these traditional workloads. And the only way to get that experience is to, is to get your hands dirty. Right. So how would you describe the persona specifically here versus say KubeCon? IT ops? Very, very different. Well, <laughs> okay, yes. Cool, go ahead, explain. So, well, I mean, from, from this perspective, this is all about uh, you know, VMware and, and everything that they have, op have to offer. Uh, so we're dealing with a lot of administrators from that regard. Uh, on the Kubernetes side, we have uh, site reliability, reliability engineers and their goal is exactly as their title describes. They want to architect our applications that are very resilient and reliable. And uh, it is a different way of, of working. I, I was on a Twitter spaces about SREs and DevOps. And there was uh, people saying their title's called DevOps. Like, no, 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 you do DevOps, you don't really, you're not the DevOps right, person. Right. Uh, but that, you bec they become the DevOps person because you're the developer running operations. So yeah. it's been weird how DevOps has been co opted as a position. You know. and, and, and that is really interesting. Uh, one person told me uh, early when I started Casting, like, we have this new persona, it's the DevOps person, right? That is the person that we're going after. But then talking to a few other people, we're like, they're not falling from space. <laughs> it's people who used to do other jobs yeah. who now have a more DevOps approach to what, what they're doing. It's and, then not the, a new and then the SRE conversation was in Site Reliable Engine. It comes from Google, from one person managing multiple clusters. The, how that's evolved into being the DevOps. So mm. it's been interesting. And this is really the growth of scale, the 10X you know, developer, going to more of the cloud native, which is, okay, you got to run ops and make the developer go faster. So if you look at the stuff we've been covering on theCUBE, it's the trends have been cloud native developers, which I call DevOps like developers, they want to go faster, they want self-service, and they don't want to slow down, they don't want to deal with BS, which is go check in security code, wait for the ops team to do something. So data and security seem to be the new ops not so much IT ops, because that's now cloud. So how do you guys see that in, 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 because Kubernetes is rationalizing this, certainly on the compute side, not mm -hmm. so much on storage yet, but it seems to be making things better in that grinding area between dev and these complicated ops areas, like security, data, where it's constantly changing. What, what do you think about well, that? Well, there, there are still a lot of specialty folks in that area in, in regards to uh, uh, security operations. Um, it, the whole idea is to be able to you know, script and automate as much as possible, not have to create a ticket to request a VM to be built or an operating system or an application deployed. It, they are really empowered to, to automatically deploy those applications and keep them up. Yeah, and that was the old DevOps role or person. That was what DevOps was called, right? So again, that, that is standard. I think at KubeCon, that, you, that is something that's expected. Yes. Mm -hmm. You would agree with that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so now translating VMworld, VMware Explorer, 
to KubeCon, what do you guys see as happening between now and then, and then obviously got reInvent, you know, right at the end and first week of December coming. So that's going to be two major shows coming in now, back to back. That's going to be super interesting for this ecosystem. C quite frankly, if we if you compare the persona, may maybe you have to step away from comparing the personas, but really compare the conversations that we're having. Mm. The yeah, conversations that you're having at a KubeCon are really deep dives. We will have people coming into our booth and taking 45 minutes, one hour of the time of the people who are supposed to do 10 minute demos because they're asking more and more questions because they want to know every little detail, how things work. The conversations here are more like, why should I learn Kubernetes? Why should I start using Kubernetes? So it's really early day. Now, I'm not saying that in a bad way. This is really exciting because when you hear CNCF say that 97% uh, of, of enterprises are, are using Kubernetes, that's obviously that small part of their world. Those are their members, right? We now want to see that grow to, to the entire uh, ecosystem, the larger ecosystem. Well, it's actually a great thing, actually. It's not a bad thing, but I will counter that by saying I am hearing the conversation here. This is, you guys will like this on the Veeam side, the other side of the Veeam. There's deep dives on ransomware and air gapping oh, yeah. and configuration errors on backup and recovery. Um, and you know, it's all about Veeam on the other side. Mm -hmm. So those are the guys here talking deep dive on making sure they don't get screwed up on ransomware. Yeah. Not Kubernetes, but they're going to Kubernetes, but they're now leaning into Kubernetes. They're crossing into the new era because that's the apps that end up writing the code for that. So, the funny part is, uh, like all of those concepts, ransomware and recovery, they're all, there are similar concepts in the world of Kubernetes. And uh, you know, both on the, the Veeam side as well as the Kasten side, we are supporting a lot of those air gap solutions and providing a, a ransomware recovery solution. Uh, and from an air gap perspective, there are a many use cases where you do need to live. It's not just the government entity, but you know, uh, we, ha we have customers that are cruise lines oh, yeah. uh, in Europe, for example, and they're disconnected, so they need to live in that disconnected world, or military as well. If well, we let's talk about the adoption of customers. I mean, this is the, mm -hmm. the customer side. What's accelerating their, what's their, what's the current situation with the customer base with Kubernetes? And not just here, but like in the industry with Kubernetes. How would you guys categorize that? And how does that get accelerated? What's the customer situation? Uh, a big drive to Kubernetes is really about the, the automation, self-service, and, and, and reliability. Uh, we're seeing the drive to, put, and reduction of resources, being able to do more with less, right? This is ongoing, this is the way it's always been. Uh, but I was talking to a large university in Western Canada, and they're a huge Veeam customer worth 7,000 VMs. And three months ago, they said, over the next few years, we plan on moving all those workloads to Kubernetes. So, and th the reason for it is really to reduce their workload, both from the administration side a, a, and cost perspective, as well as, uh, you know, as on-prem resources as well. So there's a lot of good business reasons to do that, in addition to the technical uh, reliability concerns. So what is those specific reasons? This is where now you start to see the rubber hit the road on, on acceleration. Yeah, so um, I would say scale, and flexibility, that ecosystem, that, that, that opportunity to choose any application from, from that uh, or, or any tool from that uh, cloud native ecosystem is, is a big driver. Um, I wanted to add to the adoption, uh, another area where I see a lot of interest is everything AI, machine learning. Uh, one example um, is a, also um, a customer coming from Veeam. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that, and that, that's a great thing. Uh, it's uh, an AI company that is um, doing software for automated driving. Uh, they decided that VMs alone were not going to be good enough for all of their workloads, and then for select workloads, the, the more uh, scalable one, where scalability was uh, more of a topic, uh, would move to Kubernetes. I, I think at this point they have like 20% of their workloads on Kubernetes, and they're not planning to do away with VMs. VMs are always going to be there, uh, just like mainframes still exist. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, they're accelerating, but they were actually. projecting over the next few years they were going to go to a 50-50 and eventually lean towards more Kubernetes than VMs, but it was going to be a mix. Do you have a favorite customer example, Tom, that you think really articulates the value of what Kubernetes can deliver to customers where you guys have really come in and helped to demystify it? I would think Soprastera is a really great example and you know the details about I, that. I, I love the, the Soprastera story. Um, they were a uh, their AWS customer 
and they're running OpenShift version 3, and they need to move to OpenShift, 4, uh, OpenShift version 4. There is no upgrade in place. You have to migrate all your apps. Now, Superstereo is a large French IT firm. They have over 700 uh, developers in their environment, and it was by their estimation that this was going to take a few months to get that migration done. Uh, we were able to go in there and help them with the automation of that migration, and Kasten was able to ha help them architect that migration, and we did it in the course of a weekend with two people. A weekend? A weekend. That's a hackathon. Yeah. I mean, that's, th that's, not, <laughs> but that's not real, come on. Compared to thousands of man hours yeah. and, and a few months, not to mention since they were able to retire that old OpenShift cluster, the OpenShift 3, they were able to, to stop paying Jeff Bezos for a couple of those months, which <laughs> is you know tens of thousands of dollars per month. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, keep that strategy. down low, you're going to get shot when you leave the, at this place. No, seriously, this is why I think the multi-cloud hybrid is interesting because this, these kinds of examples are going to be more than less coming down the road. You're going to hear more of these stories mm -hmm. than, yeah. than not hear them because what containerization now Kubernetes is doing, what Docker's doing now, and the role of containers not being such a land grab is allowing Kubernetes to, to be more versatile in its approach. So I got to ask you, you can almost apply that concept to agility to other scenarios like spanning data across clouds. Yes. And I, that is what we're seeing. So the call I had this morning with a large insurance provider, you may have that insurance <laughs> provider, healthcare provider, uh, you know, they're across uh, you know, three of the, the major hyperscalers clouds and they do that for liability. You know, last year AWS went down I think three times in Q4 and um, you know, to have a plan of being able to recover somewhere else, yeah. you can actually plan your it's <laughs> DR, it's a planned migration. You can do that in, in a few hours. You know, it's interesting, just a sidebar here for a second. We had a couple of chats earlier today. We had the influencers on and all the super cloud conversations and uh, trying to get more data to share with the audience across multiple areas. One of them was Amazon and the super, uh, the hyper clouds like Amazon, Azure, Google, and you know, the rest are out there, Oracle, IBM, and everyone else. There's almost a, a consensus that maybe it's, there's time for some peace, right, amongst the cloud vendors. Like, hey, you've already won. <laughs> okay, like, like <laughs> everyone's won. Let's just like, <laughs> we know where everyone is. Let's go peacetime. And everyone, then, because the relationship's not going to change between public cloud and the new world. So there's a consensus like, what does peace look like? I mean, first of all, the pie's getting bigger. You're seeing ecosystems forming around all the big new areas. And that's a good thing, that's the, the tide's rising, the pie's getting bigger, there's, there's a bigger market out there now. So people can share and share, okay, go ahead. Yeah, but, but you know, <laughs> and, and I've never worked for any of these big, <laughs> okay. big players, so I, I, oh, yeah. I would have to agree with you, but peace would not drive innovation. <laughs> and, and my heart is okay. with tech innovation. Yeah. I love it when, when, when vendors come up with new solutions that will make things better for customers. And if that means that we're moving from on-prem to cloud and back to on-prem, <laughs> I'm fine with that. Uh, okay. what what excites me is really having the, the flexibility of being able to choose any provider you want because you do have open standards being cloud native you know, in the world of Kubernetes. Uh, you know, it's, I've recently discovered that the uh, Canadian federal government had mandated to their financial institutions that yes, you may have started all of your on-cloud presence in Azure, you need to have an option to be elsewhere. Yeah. So it's not like- Well the sovereign cloud is one of those big initiatives. But also going back to Java, we heard another guest earlier, we were riffing about Java, write once, run anywhere, right? So, so can, you know, can't do that today in the cloud, but now with containers, you, you can't. Again, this is again, this is the point that's happening. Explain. Uh, so when you have, you know, Kubernetes is, is a, a strict standard and all of the applications are written to that. So whether you're deploying MongoDB or Postgres uh, or Cassandra or any of the other cloud native apps, you can deploy them pretty much the same whether they're in AKS, EKS, or on Tanzu, and it makes it much easier. The world became just a lot less proprietary. So that's the story that everybody wants to hear. How does that happen in a way that is, doesn't stall the innovation and the developer growth? Because the developers are driving a lot of change. I mean, for all the talk in the industry, the developers are doing pretty good right now. I mean, they got a lot of open source, you know, plentiful open source growing like crazy. You got shifting left in, in the CI CD mm -hmm. pipeline. You got tools coming out with Kubernetes. Infrastructure as co code is almost a 100% reality right now. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of good things going on for developers. That's not an issue. 
The issue is on just underneath. <laughs> like, it's what the skill set. And that, that is really one of the, uh, the biggest challenges that I see in, in our deployments is uh, a lack of uh, experience. And it's not everyone. There are some folks that have been playing around for the last couple of years with it, and, and they do have the experience. But there are many people that are, that are still, still young at this. Okay, let's do a, uh, as we wrap up, let's do a lead into KubeCon. It's coming up, and I was reinvents right behind it. Lisa, we're going to have a lot of pre-KubeCon uh, uh, interviews, we'll interview all the committee chairs, program chairs, we'll get the scoop on that, we do that every year. But while we got you guys here, let's do a little pre-pre-preview of, uh, of KubeCon. What can we expect? What do you guys think is going to happen this year? What does KubeCon look like? You guys are our big sponsor of KubeCon, you guys do a great job there, thanks for, for doing that, the community really recognizes that. But as Kubernetes comes in now for this year, you're looking at probably the what, third year now that I would say Kubernetes has been on the front burner. Where do you see it on the hockey stick growth? Is this, uh, has we kicked the curve yet? What's going to be the level of intensity for Kubernetes this year? How's that going to impact KubeCon in a way that might, people may or may not think it will? So I think first of all, um, KubeCon is going to be back at the level where it was before the pandemic because the show, as many other shows, uh, has been suffering from, I mean, virtual events are not like yeah. the in-person events. Uh, KubeCon LA was super exciting for all the vendors last year, uh, but the attendees were not really there yet. Valencia was a huge bump already, and I think uh, Detroit, it's a very exciting city I heard. So it's, it's going to be uh, a blast, and it's going to be uh, a huge attendance. That's what I'm expecting. Uh, second, um, I can, so this is going to be my third, personally, uh, in-person KubeCon, uh, comparing how vendors evolved between the previous uh, two. There's going to be a lot of interesting stories from vendors, a lot of new innovation coming onto the market, uh, and I think the conversations that we're going to be having uh, will yet again be much more about live applications and people using Kubernetes uh, in production, rather than those at the first uh, in-person KubeCon for me in LA, where it was a lot about learning still. Uh, we're going to continue to help people learn because it's really important for us, mm -hmm. um, but the exciting part about KubeCon is you're talking to people who are using Kubernetes in production, and that's really cool. And, and users contributing projects too. You got, also. I mean, yeah. the Lyft is a poster child there, and you've got a lot more. And of course, you've got the stealth recruiting going on there. Apple, all the big guys are there. It's mm. interesting they have a booth and no one's attending. You're like, oh, come on. Yeah. Matt, what's your take on KubeCon? What are you going in? What do you see? I mean, obviously, a lot of dynamic new projects. I'm going to see uh, much, much deeper uh, tech conversations. You know, as, as experience, increases, you know, the the more you learn, the more you realize you, you have to learn more. And the sharing's going to increase and too. And the sharing, yes. So I, I, I see a, a, a lot of deep conversations. It's no longer the, why do I need Kubernetes? It's more, how do I make, how, how do I architect this for my solution and, or for my environment? And uh, yeah, I think there's a lot more depth involved. And, and the size of KubeCon is going to be much larger than we've seen in the past. And, and to finish off with, I think from the vendor's point of view, what we're going to see is a lot of uh, applications that will be uh, a lot more enterprise ready. Uh, because that is the part that was missing so far. Uh, it was a lot about the um, what's new and enabling Kubernetes. Uh, but now that adoption is going up, uh, a lot of features for different components still need to be added to, uh, to have them enterprise ready. And what can the audience expect from you guys at KubeCon? We Any teasers you can give us from a marketing perspective? Uh, yes, we have uh, a rebranding sitting ready for a learning website. It's going to be bigger and better. So we're not, no longer going to call it learning.custom.io, but I'll be happy to come back with you guys and present a okay. new name at KubeCon. All right. All right, that sounds like a deal. Guys, thank you so much for joining John and me, breaking down all things Kubernetes, talking about customer adoption, the challenges, but also what you're doing to demystify it. We appreciate your insights and your time. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Our pleasure. Thanks, Matt. For our guests and John Furrier, I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching theCUBE's live coverage of VMware Explorer 2022. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe.